humble, gentle Savior. Hear our humble cry. We have known when you've come and called and touched others. And we, with open arms, open hearts, and open minds, cry out, do not pass us by. But as there is power in the name of Jesus, we also know there's power in the hands of Jesus. So come, and may every person in this church this morning know the precious and powerful touch of the Lord, our healer. In his name, we ask and we pray. Amen. Church, if you could stay on your feet as we're going to read the word of God. And so in reverence, we're going to stand on our feet to hear him speak to us. If you could please turn to Luke chapter 4, verse 38 to verse 41. Verse 38 to 41. If you could turn there or swipe there or flick there or whatever you do. Luke 4, 38 to 41. After leaving the synagogue the day, Jesus went to Simon's house where he found Simon's mother-in-law very sick with a high fever. Please heal her, every same bitches. Standing at the head beside her, he removed the fever and he left her. And she got up as once and prepared the meal for them. As the sun went down in the evening, people threw out to the village, brought sick family members to Jesus. No matter what their disease were, the touch of his heart healing everyone. Many were possessed by demons, and demons came out at his commands shooting, you are the son of God, but, but because they knew it, that he has the Messiah, he refused hands them and the book refused to let them speak. This is the holy word of God. Amen. Thanks be to God. Worship team, if you'd like to find your seats and if you would all like to take your seats. I'll just keep hold of that just in case. The grass withers, the flower fades, but the word of our Lord stands forever. Amen. I have entitled our sermon this morning, When the Healer Comes to Town. When the Healer Comes to Town. I'm going to pray one last time. Heavenly Father, Almighty Son, and wonderful Holy Spirit, hear our humble cry and help us, we pray. In that great name of Jesus, amen. Friends, do you know that Jesus heals? Amen. About nearly 6,000 years ago, early on in the pages of the Bible, in Exodus chapter 15, uh, the Lord our God revealed something about himself through one of his names. And he said, I am Jehovah Rophi, which meant the Lord is your healer. And that same Lord, 4,000 years after that, came from heaven to earth and took on flesh and took on the name of Jesus, which means Jehovah saves. Jesus is Jehovah, which means all the names that Jehovah revealed of himself in the old, Jesus still holds in the new. And so friends, oh, did you know that Jesus is the Lord who heals? Jesus is the Lord who heals. And if you're still unsure, and if you think I'm just making this up, Maybe it's a legend, maybe it's a myth, maybe it's just found uh, in some words on a page. That's not true. Let me show you. Why don't you walk with me into Israel 2,000 years ago, a town named, named Capernaum. 
walk with me there and I'll show you something. I'll show you that everything I have said, that the Lord is our healer, is absolutely true. Have a look at verse 38 and 39 in Luke chapter 4. As Jesus arose and left the synagogue and entered Simon's house. Now Simon's mother-in-law was ill with a high fever and they appealed to him on her behalf. And he, Jesus, stood over her and rebuked the fever, and it left her. Jesus, in the town called Capernaum, nearly 2,000 years ago, entered from the synagogue into Simon's house and healed a woman. And one of the first things we notice in this passage this morning is that Jesus goes from the public place to the private place. Are you seeing that? Jesus arose, it says, and left the synagogue, the place of worship, the public place of worship, which on a Sabbath, the whole town would have been there worshiping, praying to the Lord. And it was there last week we saw that Jesus had cast out an evil spirit. And Jesus doesn't then go to a larger synagogue, a larger town. He doesn't go outside of Israel to Rome, the center of the world at that time, going off of his newfound fame and glory. No, no, he goes from the public place to the private. And this is something about Jesus that is completely uh, countercultural to our time completely antithetical to most of humanity's hearts, arguably all of humanity's hearts, that that Jesus is not interested in the earthly fame. He's not interested in the temporary bright lights and adoring crowds because he can do some amazing and some powerful things. One of the things that as we walk through Luke, we'll see time and time again is that Jesus puts away the temporary earthly glory because he knows of a glory that is greater than what he can find on earth. He knows that he has an eternal glory in heaven waiting for him. And he knows that this earth will one day end and be renewed and then the glory he has on this earth will not be temporary and fleeting but will be eternal and forever. There's something about that heart of Jesus that is so hard for us as humans to grasp. We would love to just stand there in those crowds as they chant our names and say, oh, what a wonderful man he is, casting out evil spirits, so strong, so powerful. But but Jesus doesn't do that. He goes from the public into the private. And not just public to private, he goes from the house of God into the house of man. Jesus isn't one of those pastors who you only see on a Sunday morning. Jesus isn't only one of those pastors who the first time he's prayed all week is on a Sunday morning. But trust me, they are out there. Uh, Jesus isn't one of those people of a holy God who the first time he's opened the the word of God is on a, 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 a Sunday morning. No, Jesus goes from the house of God, the public, to the house of man, the private. Church, did you know that Jesus isn't only found in church on a Sunday morning? Did you know Jesus isn't only found in church on a Sunday morning? Uh, But Jesus works for us as much on a Wednesday as he does on a Sunday. Amen? Amen? Jesus isn't only found here while the band sing worship songs. And something feels good inside of you. He is here, very much so. But he's not only here. Of course, a Sunday is special. The Lord has set that aside as a day for his people to come together and worship him. But but Jesus is still the same Jesus on a Wednesday as he is on a Sunday. He's not only found in the house of God. He's also found in the house of man. I'm not sure if you know this, but on a Wednesday, he still walks with you. On a Wednesday, he still talks with you. 
on a Wednesday, he still tells you that you are his own. He's as much with you right now in your seat in this church as he is by your bedside when you wake up at 3 a.m. and you're struggling to sleep. He's the same Jesus. He is comfortable being Jesus wherever he is. There's some people who find certain situations harder to be in than others. There's some people who love to be on their own. And there's some people who love to be around other people. But Jesus is comfortable being Jesus wherever and whoever and whatever day of the week that it is. And that's why Sunday cannot be our spiritual CPR. Sunday can't be that time when I've not known Jesus all week, I've not walked with him or talked with him or known that I am his own all week. And so then Sunday comes, I need this jolt of energy. I need something to keep me going spiritually. No, Sunday is supposed to be the cherry on top of this wonderful cake which we have been making all week as we've come to feed and be filled with Jesus. Can you imagine what our Sunday mornings would be like if we already came filled with the Spirit of God? If we already came with our eyes turned upon Jesus? If we already came living, not on bread alone, but on every word that comes from the mouth of our God? And as Jesus goes from the public into the private, as he goes from the house of God into the house of man, he is requested to heal a woman with a fever. And he does. And I'm thankful that this is in here. I'm thankful that Luke notes what type of illness this lady has. Because when the Lord says that he heals, he doesn't then have a list of certain illnesses that he'll heal. Some of you are thinking, what do you mean, Pastor? Okay, well, I'll tell you, there's, there's many of us who for some reason have it in our heads that if I have a headache, uh, I'm, gonna, I, I'm not going to go to the Lord in prayer for healing. Uh, that if I've hurt my knee or my ankle, that, or, that, or, or, or that pain and that sickness is too small to bring to God. I'll just be wasting his time. I'll just be taking his power when there's others out there who have much more serious illnesses. When the Lord said, I am your healer, he didn't then say, but I'll only heal the serious things. I'll only heal the, the really bad things. He just says, I am your healer. Now, of course, back then, a fever was a serious thing. It was a big thing because they didn't have the medical capabilities which we have now. But for us, a fever is not that serious anymore. Most people in the West, especially, who have a fever are able to live through that and able to be strengthened after that. And so that means then, if times have now changed, am I not allowed to pray for Jesus to come and heal me when I've got a fever, because it, it's not that serious anymore. She was allowed because it was serious, but I'm not allowed because I've got the hospitals and the medicine to help it. Not that there's anything wrong with medicine and hospitals, let's be clear, that's a blessing from God. But what I'm trying to get at, what I'm trying to communicate to you is, how do we know when a sickness is too small to not bring to a big God? Who's in charge of that? Who that calculates if a fever was large enough then but is too small now? Who calculates that you can pray for a hernia now but not a headache? Who's, who's, who is in charge of that? Uh, G. Campbell Morgan, who was an English pastor and preacher, he was one Sunday evening preaching a sermon on the greatness of God. And uh, as he came down and he finished and the service ended, he went to the back of his church so he could go and shake hands with everyone. And a little old lady walks up to him. And she says, Pastor, 
if God is that great, then does he really care about the small things in my life? Am I allowed to bring to him in prayer the small things in my life? And G. Campbell Morgan looked at her and said, oh dear, to that great God, everything is small. To that great God, everything is small. Friends, we do not calculate what is worthy to bring to God in prayer based upon us, based upon what others say, based upon how times have changed. We, we know what we can bring to God in prayer for healing based upon what the Lord has said we can bring to God in prayer for healing. And do you know what he says? He says, do not be anxious about anything, but bring everything to God in prayer. In Philippians chapter 4, do not be anxious about anything. No sickness, no fever, no headache, no bad ankle, no hernia, but bring everything to God in prayer. Everything to him is small. You're not, you're not taking his time from somebody else. You're not taking his power from somebody else. I'm not sure if you realize this, but, but he's, he has all the time in the world. Because he's outside of time, he is eternal. He has all the power in the world. Uh, because he's not held by human capacity for power, he is a holy God who is all-powerful. And he has chosen to say, bring everything in prayer, because I can do everything through prayer. Amen. Amen. So last week when I was preaching, I told people that I want them to help me to preach and to preach back to me. And so if there's something worthy of worshiping our Jesus for, then please, amen, hallelujah, applause, sing, raise hands, whatever you want to do, okay? We might be in England, uh, but we are Christians, okay? And so we're going to prepare for heaven. And the worst sermons ever are when they're preached by one man. All right, I want the whole church to preach this morning. It is not a library, it is a church, okay? So please preach back to me. Everyone needs to hear your voice as much as mine. But, but it's clear, and I love that Luke has mentioned what sickness she has because it shows us that there is nothing outside of the power of Jesus, but actually his healing hands reach from England to Asia, from someone who has a hernia to a headache. His hands reach far enough and we know he can do it. We know he can heal when we ask him to because he did it in Capernaum 2,000 years ago. Walk through this text with me. Jesus goes from the public to the private, from the house of God to the house of man, but, but this house of man is not just any man. I'm not sure if you noticed, but Luke actually names him. House of, of Simon. In other passages in Matthew and Mark, we see it's Simon um, Peter. Simon Peter is soon to become one of the apostles of Jesus, which hasn't happened yet, but it will happen very soon at the start of Luke chapter 5. And it's interesting, isn't it, that the first interaction that Simon Peter has with Jesus is not when he's called to follow him, but it's actually when Simon calls Jesus to help him. And the first interaction is in not the house of God, but in Simon's own house. We learn a few things about Simon in this passage. We learn that he is married with a wife because he's asked for healing for his mother-in-law. And we know that he was living with Andrew from other passages. And so this is a house filled with people. You've got Simon, his brother Andrew, his wife, and his mother-in-law. The father-in-law is not mentioned, so he's potentially passed away before this time. And Simon doesn't just call Jesus in because he sees him walking past. No, Simon is in Capernaum. And so like Jesus, he would have been worshipping the holy God on that holy day. Simon would have been at the synagogue seeing Jesus cast out an evil spirit from a man. Simon would have seen that incredible wonder, that incredible power. And so Jesus doesn't just accidentally turn up at their house, no, but Simon and his family have seemed to have led Jesus into their house because they have a purpose, they have a need, and so they bring Jesus into their home because they believe that, that what they've just seen 
this one who has all this authority and all this power to cast out evil spirits could help them and heal their mother-in-law. They appeal to Jesus to heal her because they believe he can. They appeal to Jesus to heal her because they believe that he can. We see that in verse 38. It says, Now Simon's mother-in-law was ill with a high fever, and they appealed, they pleaded, they begged him on her behalf. Now Simon and his family are not yet followers of Jesus. They don't yet have a Christian saving faith in Jesus. But they do have some kind of faith here. They do have some kind of faith in the power of Jesus. They've seen him do incredible things already, and they believe that if he can do that, then he could do this. And we should expect this in a story about healing. We should expect that faith has popped up in a story of healing. Because faith and healing are very closely knit. Now, in the Bible, there are a small number of healings uh, which are done when nobody has faith, and nobody even prays. It's a very small amount. And that's able to happen because our God is a sovereign healer. He's in the heavens and he does whatever he pleases. However, 99% of the healings in the Bible come with faith involved. Come with faith involved. Just think about Matthew 9, verse 22, and Jesus says, Your faith has made you whole. Or Mark 10, verse 15. 52, and he says, your faith has made you well. Acts chapter 3, verse 16, faith in the name of Jesus has brought this man perfect health. There's countless more, but an important one is James chapter 5, verse 15, and the apostle James there teaches that the prayer of faith will save the one who is sick, and the Lord will raise him up. The prayer of faith will save the one who is sick, and the Lord will raise him up. We know from Hebrews 11, verse 6, that without faith, we cannot please God. Without faith, we cannot please God. And so, yes, God can heal in spite of faith. Yes, God can heal when there is no faith. But primarily, generally, God loves to work through faith to heal. He's chosen that the means of healing is through faith-filled prayer through your faith through their faith through faith God is pleased to heal and this this makes sense we shouldn't feel awkward about this because faith is an expression of neediness isn't it faith is an expression of neediness God I need you God, I can't, but I believe that you can. Faith is this, is this expression of neediness that I'm relying on you, God. I'm standing on you, God. I'm falling on you, God. I'm sitting with you, God. That is faith. Trusting that only God can take us through. Trusting that there's nothing in us that can, but he is able. And what we see is that Simon and the family appeal to Jesus to heal their mother-in-law because they believe that Jesus can. They don't know him yet as their savior, but they do see him as one who is powerful. They believe Jesus can heal, so they ask him to. This is, this is also why we can't say, and you might have heard this, you might have been hurt by this. Some teachers say, you haven't been healed because you don't have enough faith. It's a horrible thing to say. It's an abusive, a spiritually abusive thing to say. You haven't been healed because you don't have enough faith. This family didn't even have saving faith in Jesus. They didn't even believe in him as their savior, their Messiah. And yet, and yet, based on this tiny thing they saw and heard of an evil spirit being cast out, they had this minuscule seed of faith in the power of Jesus. I don't even know if it was as big as a seed. And Jesus healed through their faith, through their prayers. And that's encouraging to us, right? Because we know where in the Bible it says that faith the size of a mustard seed can move mountains. 
faith the size of a mustard seed can move mountains. So imagine what it can do to heal a bad knee. Imagine what can happen through faith to help a headache. It's important to focus on faith when we're talking about healing. Because we can sometimes have a a wrong idea about faith. We think that faith uh, in the Bible is always talked about as this perfect thing, this pure thing, that you need to have absolute faith, perfect faith. No questions asked. You just believe. But in the Bible, faith is never spoken about like that. It's never spoken about as something that is pure and perfect. Faith is never spoken about as something that doesn't have questions alongside it, that doesn't have uncertainties inside of it. No, faith is always talked about as something we need to fight for, something that is gritty and rough and real, something we need to hold on to in spite of all those uncertainties rolling around us. Faith is always described as something that in spite of of all these questions we have, in spite of all these feelings we have, we still call on the name of the Lord with this mustard seed of faith which we've got. And then we see what he does. And I ask you to try that. Try Jesus. Try him. Try him with all your questions, all your uncertainties, all of your unsureties. Just try him with that mustard seed of faith call on him, ask of him, see what he will do. I dare you. Because he is able, we are told, to do exceedingly and abundantly more than we can ask. So we got mustard seed to move a mountain. Jesus will move a whole whole fleet of mountains because he is able. It's okay to have questions and doubts and uncertainties. The problem is when you stay in them, when you sit in them. So when you're praying for healing, and you'll hear me, when I pray for someone to be healed, I'll often say, Lord, we have questions. We are uncertain. God, we have many, many doubts, but we believe. Help our unbelief and heal my brother and my sister. That's a faithful prayer. There's nothing wrong with that prayer. That's a great prayer to pray. Lord, it's in the Bible. Lord, I believe. Help my unbelief. To believe is never at the absence of unbelief. To be sure is never at the absence of uncertainty. God knows you're human. All he asks is that you know that he is God. It's not worth um, Simon and his family. Just hoping that Jesus heals as he walks past. No. They need to have the faith to ask him. And they do. And so what we see in this passage is not just that they have faith, but we also see the character of faith which is needed. Uh, That faith must be expectant. Faith must be expectant. It's not enough just to believe that in spite of the fog and the mist in my life, I still believe that the sun shines. What we need is to believe that the sun still shines at the end of that fog and that mist and actually walk forward. Actually expect that we will find that sun shining. Actually expect that we will come to the end of the fog. And so it's not enough that Simon and his family just sit in their house and hope that Jesus walks past and heals, but they need to act on it. They need to be expectant that when they ask, Jesus will. When they ask, Jesus will. The reason many of us see so little miracles in this church and in our lives is because we do not expect them. We know God heals. And I might throw up the odd prayer, but am I really expecting that he will heal? Am I really expecting that someone who is fatally sick and ill, that when I pray the prayer of faith, God will raise them up, as his Bible says? Faith without expectancy is just empty hope. And so what we see is not just the presence of faith in this passage, but the character of faith. 
and that this mustard seed of faith needs to be covered with the shell of expectancy. That we're not just throwing up a prayer and hoping for, for the best, but we are praying knowing that God answers, knowing that God is able, knowing that God will. He is expectant as he appeals to Jesus to help and to heal. And so a great, a great question to ask yourself, to test your faith, is how expectant am I really? As you came to church this morning, how expectant were you that God would meet with you in your trouble? That God would touch you in your problems? How expectant were you that as we worship in this town, we'll see this hundreds and thousands in this town saved? How expectant are we? Because God loves to work through expectant faith. As a husband loves to come home to an expectant wife, God loves to heal and work through an expectant child of God. He loves to work through expectant faith. It's not all we see here. Because do you notice that the faith is not found in the one who is being healed? But the mother-in-law is sick in bed with a fever. Uh, she's not awake enough. She's not able enough to even know who Jesus is. She wasn't there to see what he did so powerfully. She's been in bed sick. There's no faith found in her. And yet she is healed. But what also we see in this passage is that faith is never absent of works. It's never absent of expectancy and it's never absent of works. You'll know this better than me. There are some people in your life who you need to bring Jesus to them because they won't or they can't come to Jesus themselves. This lady was in her bed sick. She couldn't go to Jesus and be healed, so Simon and his family brought Jesus to her. And there are going to be people in your life, sick people, lost people, children, family members, friends who can't or won't because of their sickness or their sin or something else. They can't or they won't come to Jesus. And so you need to bring Jesus to them. That you have got this gift of faith. You've got this knowledge of who he is. You know how powerful he is. You know he saves and they can't or they won't. So you need to bring Jesus to them. And that's love. As those friends went on top of that roof and they clawed and they grabbed to make a hole in the roof to let their friend down through it so that he could be healed by Jesus. That's how we should live our lives. I'm serious. That's how we should live our lives. Our energy, our time should be spent pouring ourselves out so that others can be healed. Others can be saved. How selfish would it be? If those friends knew that their friend was sick in his bed, that Jesus was out there healing everybody, and they just said, oh, I do hope that one day soon he'll just, just walk out of that bed and go and see Jesus. He's paralyzed. He can't. Wouldn't that be a terrible friendship? Well, isn't it, isn't it very similar to many of us who look at our children look at our parents who look at our friends and our family and we sit then we go oh lord i do hope that you will break through one day they're paralyzed in sin they're blind and they're lost there are people who can't and won't come to jesus and so we need to take jesus to them and that is the act of faith on their behalf we appeal to jesus for them we take jesus to them. We need to do what Simon and their family, who weren't even Christians, did for their own mother-in-law. And so they bring Jesus into their home. He sees their faith. He hears their appeals and their prayers. He walks over to, the, to this lady. He walks over to this elderly lady, and he does something which Luke doesn't record, but in Matthew, who records the same story, 
he speaks about this. And in Matthew, it tells us that as Jesus walks over, stands over her, rebukes, casts out this illness from her, he touches her hand. I had to spend a long time this week just thinking about that. How Jesus touches her hand. She does not know him, but he knows her. Jesus touches her hand and she is healed. Last week, we were an audience to the fact that there is power in the name of Jesus. This week, the Lord has brought us to be an audience to the fact that there is power in the hands of Jesus. There is power in the hands of Jesus. As you read on in verse 40 and 41, we find out that that everyone Jesus touches is healed. Everyone Jesus touches is healed. There is power in the hands of Jesus. Have you been touched by the hands of Jesus, church? Have you been touched by the hands of Jesus? Have you been held by the hands of Jesus? Have you felt that his hands rise up and calm the storm in your life? Have you felt those chains break at the hands of Jesus in your life? Because you can. The hands of Jesus weren't just found on an old lady 2,000 years ago, but they're found on you today. The same Jesus with the same hands as back then is with us this morning. He's with us this morning. And he's saying, come to me. Come to me. Come to me. And if you can't, don't worry, because you have a pastor who'll bring him to you. And I'm bringing Jesus to you this morning, and I'm saying there's power in the hands of Jesus. As we believe there's power in the name, there's power in the hands. Power to heal. Power to love. Power to assure. Power to bring peace. Power to protect. How incredible is it when you're anxious and you're scared and someone whom you love just puts their hand on your shoulder? Imagine if that was from Jesus. You don't need to imagine. He is with us this morning. Power in his hands to redeem. Power to raise the dead. There is power in the precious hands of Jesus. A touch from the king changes everything. The touch of the heavenly healer is not like those earthly healers in our hospitals and our NHS. Have you realized that? That today, with modern medicine so wonderful and our NHS so helpful, there are still many sicknesses in which we have to wait months to be able to see somebody to help us. We have to wait weeks for somebody to see us, for surgery to happen, or for something else. And yet, with the heavenly healer, that's not the case. Jesus is here, not just on a Sunday, but on a Wednesday too. And he says, come. He invites you towards his healing hands. He invites you towards his powerful hands. And with our modern medicine, The way that they can heal you often is that they take away one thing and they have to give you another. You can be healed from one sickness, but then your hair will fall out or your skin will go rough and your complexion will be affected. And Again, we're thankful for our health service. We're thankful for modern medicine, but, but Jesus, but Jesus... Do you notice that when this lady is healed, she's healed immediately? She doesn't have to wait a few months to see him. She's healed immediately. And do you see what happens? She doesn't then need time to recover, but she is filled with energy and she's up on her feet. She's up on her feet. There's no weariness. There's no tiredness. There's no hunger. The healing of the perfect, of the perfect healer is a perfect healing. The healing from the perfect healer is a perfect healing. There are no side effects, no adverse side effects. Whatever work Jesus does in our life, healing us physically, emotionally, mentally, spiritually, there are no adverse side effects. 
What he actually does is he takes you into a greater place than you were even beforehand. He takes your brokenness and makes it into a blessing. He takes your sickness and gives you strength. Everything Jesus does is perfect and with purpose. It's with purpose. Do you know what that purpose is? This lady, she, she, she shows us. Because this lady responds to her healing. She stands up filled with energy and she serves them. She serves them. This lady responds to her healing by answering the purpose as to why Jesus healed her was that she would be strong enough to go forward and serve them. This is the only rightful response to being healed. This is the only rightful response to being blessed. That anyone who's known the presence and the touch of Jesus in their lives, that has experienced the blessing of health, the blessing of breath in our lungs, the only rightful response with all that we have, with all that we are, is to serve him. Is to serve him. Jesus hasn't touched us to make us a spectator in his kingdom. Jesus has touched us to make us a servant in his kingdom. And some of us, to be quite honest, probably all of us, need to repent of how we use wrongly and responded wrongly to the blessings that God has put in our life. The only rightful response is to serve him. Psalm 116 verse 12, the psalmist says, what shall I give to the Lord for all his blessings to me? My friends, if you're healed, it's not enough then to just go, all right, rather than being in church once every month, I'll go three times a month. It's not enough just to go, right, rather than paying 5% of my salary in tithe money, I'll pay 6%. It's not, it's not enough just to have these outward sacrifices because God does not glory in your outward sacrifice. God wants obedience. God wants obedience. Obedience is better than sacrifice. And so with the blessings of the Lord, with the strength of the Lord, with the healing of the Lord, we need to follow this mother-in-law and serve him. Serve him. Serve him. But Jesus isn't done. And our sermon isn't done. (laughs) But Jesus isn't done and our sermon isn't done. Because uh, Jesus then leaves this house. And he's still got more work to do. Because now the sun has set. The sun has gone down. And Jesus goes outside and the crowds come to him, bringing all their sick. And Jesus, for the rest of the night, pours himself out, exhausts himself by healing the sick and casting out the evil spirits from them. Why after the sun has gone down? That's an odd thing to say for us, isn't it? But not for them. So this was on a Saturday, which in Jewish law was the holy day, the Sabbath, where they would worship God And in the the Sabbath, it would begin as the sun set on a Friday, and then it would end as the sun set on a Saturday. And during that time, there were many laws that they had to hold to and keep. And one of those laws was that they could not hold anything. And so during the, the, the sun being up, they could not carry their sick to Jesus. But now the sun has gone down, and they bring all of their sick to Jesus. And Jesus stays up all night, and he heals them all. Jesus heals. Church, Jesus heals. So why doesn't he, so why doesn't he heal everyone? Because in this passage, it says that everyone who was brought to him, he healed. But I've prayed for healing for things, and he hasn't healed me. And you've probably prayed for people, prayed for yourself, and you haven't been healed. So if we can so emphatically say that Jesus heals, if the Lord can say from heaven, I am your healer, then why doesn't he heal everyone? That's a good question to ask. And that's a whole sermon in itself. So I can't give you all the answers. I don't have all the answers. But I do have some. So I'm going to try. Is that okay? 
some of the reasons that God might not have healed you. One of them could be about faith. We've talked about faith. And I'm not talking about a lack of faith. We don't believe in that. We don't believe in you don't have enough faith to heal you. No, but what the Bible teaches us is that God doesn't heal if there's an absence of faith. So not a lack, not a lesser, but a complete absence that there's no faith at all. Of course, we know he has done in a few times in Scripture, but generally he only heals when there is the presence of faith. So God might not have healed that person. God might not have healed you if there was a complete absence of faith. Another is our sin. James 5, verse 15 to 16 teaches us that we need to come and confess our known sins so that we will be healed. Some of you haven't been healed physically because you haven't been healed in the heart. You haven't purified yourself. You haven't brought your known sins to the Lord. I'm not on about standing there and trying to search out for something which you have done or haven't done. I'm on about your known sins that are holding back the healing from God. Another reason is that it's not that you're the source of your sickness is not, is not the physical aspect of you, but the source of your sickness is spiritual. Evil spirits can cause illness. We see in our passage that everyone brings those who are sick, and then we see that Jesus cast evil spirits out of some of these people. So the people think that my brother, my friend is sick, and Jesus goes, no, actually... It's the problem is not that he's physically sick. The problem is that he's filled with an evil spirit who is, who is manifesting himself, who's causing this sickness. And so actually you may not have been healed or someone you know hasn't been healed because this evil spirit hasn't been handled in their lives. Another reason is that God is using your sickness, your illness to refine you. And as silver and gold, we are refined in fire. And I don't know if you know this, but fire's hot. Fire's hot. If you touch it, it hurts. And as you're refined, it can hurt. In, one, in 2 Corinthians chapter 12, Paul the apostle had a thorn in his side. We don't know what that is, but he needed healing of some kind. And he asks God to heal him three times. And God said no each time. And said, no, I will not heal you. For you need to learn that my power is made perfect through weakness. That when you are weak, you are strong. You need to learn that my grace is sufficient for you. And so before we go to the heavenly hospital, sometimes God wants us to go to the school of, of sickness and suffering. To learn to grow in Christ-likeness. To learn that God's grace is enough for us. That's just a few potential reasons. Faith, sin, evil spirits, God teaching us and growing us. But what we can know is that the reason God hasn't healed you is because he doesn't love you. Paul, an apostle, was loved by Jesus. He knew that. He speaks about that. So we need to be absolutely clear and make sure that if you haven't been healed, it's not because God doesn't love you. God does love you. And we know that because whether you are healed or not, God says that for those who love me, I work all things for their good. All things for their good. And Paul knew that if he was healed, he would have peace from God. But then he also found out that if he wasn't healed, he'd still receive peace from God. And so whether you're healed or you're not, you still receive peace from God. Because God promises that, that for those who I love, for those who love me, I work good in all things. All things. All things. So whatever God has decided in your life, it's for your good. It's because he loves you. And we know that his ways are higher than our ways. His thoughts are better than our thoughts. And though the fog is thick, the sun does still shine. Though the fog is thick, the sun does still shine. And so we ask ourselves, okay, well then, pastor, I haven't been healed. So what do I do? So what do I do? Well, you need to catch this. Paul prayed three times, and he stopped. Why? 
because the Lord said stop. The Lord spoke to him and he stopped. Unless the Lord has told you to stop, then don't stop asking. Unless the Lord has told you to stop praying, then don't stop praying. Either he will stop you and bring you peace by letting you know that his grace is sufficient for you, or he will stop you by healing you and bringing you peace through the power of healing. Whatever happens, peace is on its way. Whatever happens, there is an end to the fog and the sun is still shining. But we cannot stop praying. We cannot stop asking unless he says so. Because James also says, you do not have because you do not ask. And he doesn't say it's because you haven't asked once or twice. He just says because you haven't asked. Paul, if he wasn't told to stop, would have continued praying because he knew that Jesus taught the blessing of persistent prayer. There's a story that Elisha, a prophet of the Lord, told a king to shoot your arrows into the ground and the Lord will bring you victory. And this king, he shoots his arrows once, twice, three times, and then he's just had enough. He's tired. He's tried. And Elisha says, what are you doing? What are you doing? Why have you stopped, he says. If you shot your arrows five times or six times, then the Lord would have brought you victory. We don't know. We don't know when God will bring you healing. We don't know when God will touch you with his healing hands. We don't know when God will break through in your problems and your troubles. He says, you do not have because you do not ask. And so we need to keep on praying. Think of the crowd in our story here in Luke chapter 4. They all kept coming to, to Jesus Christ. They knew that this was their time to come to him. Soon he would leave. Soon he would go. This was their time to come to him. He was here. And this crowd is huge. It's absolutely ginormous. So people would have been at the back rather than at the front. And they would have known this is our time, but it's not my, 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 my turn. They knew that this was their time, but not their, their turn. Come on, help me preach. <laughs> you all go silent on that one. They know it's their time to come to Jesus, but it's not yet their turn to be healed by Jesus. And some of you are looking at others. And on others, he is calling. On others, he is healing. On others, he is touching. And you're wondering, Lord, why do you pass me by? But he has not passed you by. Because though he would leave that place 2,000 years ago, Jesus has brought us his Holy Spirit. Meaning that he will never leave. He's all present and all powerful. And so yes, right now is our time. But maybe it's not your turn. He has not passed you by. You just got to wait. And so we keep waiting. We keep asking because the sun has gone down. The sun has gone down. If our worship team could please come back up. The sun has gone down. I keep saying that phrase, but as I say it, I'm not saying the sun as an S-U-N. I'm saying the sun as an S-O-N. The sun has gone down. For the Jews, they had to wait to come to Jesus when the sun, S-U-N, had come down. And then they had freedom to carry their burdens, their problems, their sicknesses to the Lord. We don't have to wait this morning. Our son, S-O-N, has gone down 2,000 years ago, down into the grave, and with him he took all the obstacles, all the hindrances of the Jewish law system. With him he tore the veil in the temple from top to toe. With him he took away the obstacles that kept man from God. With him, he took away the hindrance of your sin. With him, he took away any obstacle which this world or the evil one could throw at us. I'm not waiting till the end of Saturday evening to go to Jesus. I will not wait. Because Jesus' arms are open for us now. Jesus is calling us in now. 
Jesus is outside now. Jesus is inside now. Brother, sister, the sun has gone down, so we must go down to the sun. There is nothing stopping us. There is no hindrance. I have no argument. I have no plea. I have no reason. I have no rhyme. I have no excuse. For this is my time. Because emotionally, spiritually, physically, mentally, there is power in the hands of Jesus. He is able. He is able. The same Jesus that stood at the bedside of this elderly sick lady and healed her is the same Jesus who stands with us this morning. The days have changed, you have changed, but he changeth not. For he is the same yesterday, today, and forever. The same Jesus who changed water into wine takes your natural weakness and gives you supernatural strength. The same Jesus who walked on the water in a storm walks on the ways of your trouble and suffering. The same Jesus who made the lame man dance and jump tells you to stand up, jump and dance in his presence this morning. It's the same Jesus. The same Jesus who calmed the storm and silenced the thunder with just a word. Calms your storm and rests in your madness. He brings rest to your madness and your trouble. He's the same Jesus. The same Jesus who was able to do abundantly and exceedingly more than you could ask or imagine is still able. He is the same Jesus. I've studied theology for many years and let me tell you, the bedrock of all theology comes down to this. The Jesus in here is the same Jesus in here. If we can believe that this Jesus is this Jesus, then we are going to do very well as a church. Because he walks with me. He talks with me. And he tells me that I am his own. Oh, he walks with me, church. Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, he talks with me. Thursday, Friday, Saturday, he tells me that I am his own. Do you want to be healed? Jesus asked that question to one sick man. Do you want to be healed? It wasn't so much a question, but an offer. In his timing, in his way, in his goodness, in his plan, in his purpose, in his his power, he will heal you because he has said, I am the Lord, your healer. That Jesus you fell in love, the hour you first believed is the same Jesus. Your marriage is falling apart, you're sick, the world is a mess, Jesus hasn't changed. The same Jesus that changed Ephesus, Rome, Jerusalem, Athens and Thessalonica is the same Jesus that will change our town, our world, our family and friends. Church, the sun has gone down, but who will go down to the sun this morning? The sun has gone down, but who will answer that call and come down to the sun? Church, did did you know that Jesus heals? If you would stand on your feet. He is the same Jesus. We're going to sing. We're going to respond through serving our Lord in worship this morning. And it would be a bad thing of me as a pastor if I preached a sermon on how Jesus heals and I didn't invite you to come and be healed. I could and our prayer team could go into you and down to you, but that would just be awkward. So I'm going to ask if those who want healing physically, mentally, emotionally, and spiritually, if you would come down to the front so our prayer team could put their hands on you, believing that there's power in the hands of Jesus, and pray that you will be healed. Faith the size of a mustard seed can move mountains. I had one purpose coming in this morning, knowing that I can't preach a good sermon, but I can preach a good God. And my purpose was that your faith would be greater at the end of it than it was at the start. And so I hope that's happened. And so as we sing, come down to the sun. There's nothing holding you back. The sun has gone down. So please come and receive healing as our prayer team prays for you.
The sun has gone down. The veil has been torn. Christ has risen. And healing is in his hands. And so though I'm going to bring our service to a formal close, Jesus still has his hands open. And so if you have a headache or a hernia, if you have spiritual hurt or emotional struggle, Jesus wants to heal you. So come down this morning to the sun and receive healing from Jesus. I'm going to give our blessing. And after it, the band will continue to play. If you need to leave, then leave. If you want to stay and worship and fellowship, then worship and fellowship. But if you would raise your hands and receive this blessing from the Lord, which says, the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. And he says, I will bless them. And we know that he will heal us. And so please go forth in the power and the name of Jesus. And if you want prayer, if you want to worship, then stay with us and we'll pray and worship alongside you. Well, thank you.